So can you guys hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. So how was your great, uh, your kind of, uh, you know, remote learning? How was this week? It's good, bad, or very smooth. So far, good, good. How about our lecture? Do you have any comments or complaints or feedback? Good. <laughs> Clear as water, so that's good. Um, today we only have about like less than 10 students. So let's wait for another two minutes. Okay, I think we can uh, we can start. So that will be the kind of a second lecture, right? Uh, after the spring break, and um, so hopefully that our remote lecturing is pretty smooth for everybody. Uh, today that will be the seventies lectures for this class, and um, so. Again, this is a kind of a, a content for today. So previously we uh, covered the discrete optimization, right? Kind of um, give you some introductions or, and also some representative uh, examples of this discrete optimization problems. Uh, and also we introduced three very simple but somehow useful methods, right? Like um, brute force, uh, relaxation, and gradient. That will be three uh, very simple algorithms to solve this uh, discrete version uh, optimization problems. And today we gonna do more algorithms for a discrete optimization problem. And uh, actually <laughs> we will introduce three uh, algorithms. So they are very commonly used for, you know, um, kind of a discrete optimizations. But here, so we, again, we have very limited time, only about like uh, 75 minutes to cover the three um, uh, kind of algorithm. That would be a little uh, too much for this uh, kind of timing. So actually, if you look at this uh, slides, uh, we have like about 45 kind of slides in total for today. So that would be somehow kind of a double for conventional for our previous lecture uh, kind of uh, size. So probably I I talk too fast. So if you think I talk too fast, you can just let me know, I can slow down, right? So that would be the kind of things I want to heads up for this information. Again, we gonna do three more algorithms and they are more widely used than previous three. So let me just record our uh, last lecture's content. So pretty much that we introduced three uh, examples, right? So the three examples are, the first one will be the very kind of a cla uh, classic one, right? It's directly modified from the continuous problem, right? So we want to minimize the total surface area of the can. And we know that this kind of problem is constrained that we hope that the volume should be larger than 500 uh, kind of a milliliter, right? So that would be the constraints. And also, of course, the kind of a physical term FDH should be positive. So that would be the first uh, problem. Uh, but uh, our 
new thing here is that the DH, that would be integers, right? So that's how we convert a continuous problem into a discrete version, right? We add some like integrate or uh, integer constraints. So that's for the first problem. Uh, for the second problem, uh, it's pretty much a very classic problem. It's called knapsack problem, right? So the, the, the idea is that we have a knapsack and uh, we hope that we can uh, pack uh, as many items as possible, and uh, the objective is trying to maximize the total the total uh, kind of value of the bag, right? So, but with the constraint is that the bag can only hold like fifteen kilogram items, right? So you want to pick like the most valuable things. So that would be the uh, but the the reason this problem is discrete because we only have um, so for each item we only have uh, two uh, possible actions, right? Either to pack it or not pack it, right? So pretty much that's zero and one uh, variables. So that's why it's uh, discrete. Uh, the third problem, we call it a TSP or tribal salesman problem. It's also very, very classic problem. And the problem is saying that we have a number of cities, right? And this, travel, uh, this salesman wants to travel each city once, right? For example, we start from the city one, and then we travel a uh, visit three and two, five, four, something like that, right? We, we, we just travel for each city just once. So, and we hope that our total length or the total distance should be minimized. So that's the, the kind of uh, the problem setting. And the reason for this problem is discrete because the decision is that only the order of the kind of uh, cities, right? So pretty much that, that's why this problem is discrete. So you, may, you can see that uh, these three problems, they may have different background, but uh, they have uh, the same uh, natural common property that, right? Because their uh, kind of variables are discrete or have very limited sel uh, selections, right? Or we call it a kind of, um, a discrete or integers. So that would be the setting for a discrete prob a optimization problem, right? And for us, we have three uh, very simple methods to solve this kind of discrete problems. Uh, the very simplest one we call it brute force, right? So which is we list all the possible solutions and we evaluate all of them and then we can find the best one, correct? For example, here we have a, for this kind of a TSP problem, right? Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, this should be travel salesman problem. So pretty much that we can list all the possible solutions. So that will be 24, right? For this kind of very, very small problem, that's a lot of uh, uh, different possible solutions. We evaluate all of them and figure out the best one. So, but this requires a large amount of uh, evaluations, right? That's very slow and sometimes even impossible to do this, right? For example, you have uh, 10 or 100 different cities, right? That would be impossible. So we introduce a second method. So the second method, that would be somehow uh, easier to solve, right? So the idea is that for our problem, right? Because the headache for us or the most difficult part for us is actually the integer constraint, right? But if, what if we just remove this kind of uh, uh, integer constraint, then the problem is much simpler, right? That would be the continuous one. So we have a bunch of different algorithms to solve continuous uh, problem, even if we have some other continuous constraint, that would be very easy to solve, right? So compared to the integer one. So pretty much that we, we kind of remove the, the integers first and then add it back by rounding up the solutions. So that's called relaxation. Pretty much that we solve a simpler version and then round up. Okay, that would be the second. So the third method we introduced uh, last lecture, uh, that would be uh, greedy, right? We call it greedy because we can figure out a greedy approach that we can easily form a solution. For example, for this kind of lapsack problem, right? So the greedy uh, mechanism would be we, we, something like this, right? We can pick the most valuable atom you know, we can sequentially pick that one, right? For example, here, we can pick the X1 first because the ratio from value to weight, right? Value to weight ratio is a maximum one, which means the X1 item is the most valuable one. So we can pick this guy first 
and then gradually pick down the results. So this is a greedy kind of approach. But for greedy approach, the downside is that uh, you cannot guarantee this solution is the best or is the optimal. There's no guarantee for this. Uh, I should say for greedy and also for relaxation, you cannot guarantee that they are optimal. Okay, there's no guarantee for this. Um, and sometimes it's hard or it's very hard to generate some greedy uh, policy for some problems. Okay, so that, that would be some downside for these two methods. So again, these are the three uh, I mark as green color. So these are three uh, algorithms we uh, covered right in the last lecture. So pretty much that the uh, give us some kind of a flavor of how to solve the problem, right? Using very simple methods. So hopefully uh, you can recall some of this content. So any kind of questions about the three uh, simple uh, algorithms for now? Do you have any? Uh, let me see. No. no. Okay, that's somehow pretty good. Mm. Again, you can email me if you have any questions. If you if you are watching this video later or uh, during the kind of uh, completing the homework, right? You can actually ask questions about this. Okay, so now let's switch gears to some more advanced uh, algorithms, right? So we call it like uh, we have three one, right? Three methods. The, pretty much is a local search and dynamic programming and integer linear program, right? So you may heard of this algorithm, right? So some of you may know the dynamic programming, right? Correct? Or some, some of you may know linear programming or kind of local search. So actually, we will use the three uh, examples to illustrate each of these algorithms, right? Trying to give you some like, um, again, uh, just a flavor of these algorithms because the discrete optimization is really hard and a lot of tricks or algorithms have been put, uh, kind of come up with, uh, but there's no general one. So let's just um, try some of them. How about the first one, local search? So for local search, the idea is very uh, straightforward. So we just start from a very simple or feasible solution. It's okay that solution is uh, not good or somehow even very bad, but somehow we can, you know, gradually improve the solution by change some, you know, by a tiny change of the solution. So let, let's say this. For example, for this kind of a lab stack problem, right? So we can easily start from a very simple solution, right? So for example here, uh, we don't pack anything, right? So all the items are kind of excluded, right? We don't include anything. So which means x1, x2, x3, and x4, 5. So they are zero, which means we don't have anything of it, right? If for this solution, of course, it's uh, feasible, right? Because the total weight is zero. It's somehow within the constraint, right? But the value is zero which is very bad, right? We have nothing there, it's empty. So the local search idea is that, can we you know, improve the solution little by little or gradually improve the solution? So we call it a local search. So what do you think, what kind of things we want to do to modify the solution just by a little? What's the street, kind of a straightforward approach we can think of? How do we, you know, kind of improve the solutions or kind of update solutions? What would be the kind of intuitive idea to you know, find a better one starting from this zero? Any idea? Let me see. <laughs> okay, so I think Hannah is talking about, what if we say x1 equals you know, one, right? Instead of um, zero. So pretty much that, how about we just you know, change the first kind of uh, variables, right? So pretty much that's true. So the kind of a uh, local search or local update, that would be we just change or toggle one item state at once. So for example, uh, we start from empty solution, right? There's nothing inside the lab stack. Then how about we just toggle the state of X1? Toggle means that if it's zero, we change it to one, right? 
always be one with change it to zero. So for now, x1 that will be zero. So how about we change it to one, right? So we can see that if x1 will, if x1 is one, then the total will will be four, right? This still value, but the value is you know changing from zero to ten, right? So you can see that that's a huge kind of improvement for the kind of um, local search, right? Local search, this somehow we also call it local update, which means that we start from a kind of very simple solution, but we can gradually, you know, just by tweaking the parameter or kind of, you know, tweaking some kind of solutions a little bit, and then we can get a better solution. Uh, of course, we just do one kind of um, local search is not enough, so we want to do this kind of, you know, you know, many, many times, right, repeatedly. So what will be the next kind of uh, options for this? Okay, so that would be a, another method, right? So that would be, it's true that, so we, for now we get a better solution, right? Which is one, zero, 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 right? And then starting from this kind of a, solution we actually can do better so for example for x2 we can change it let me just uh, using the later one so if you focus on the inter uh, iteration two if you focus on this kind of a uh, row you can see that compared with iteration one so the only difference is we change the x2 from zero to one right pretty much that we want to include two atoms right and then we can get like a better solutions. And, uh, and then we want to do the third one. So for example, actually for the third one, it's not good because if we add a third one, then the weight will be, you know, kind of, you know, it's overweighted. So that's why the solution is not updated because X3 is not a good option for it. Uh, actually, for here we have some MATLAB code. We actually can, uh, you know, get a sense from the MATLAB code. Uh, before we move to the MATLAB, uh, I mean, do you guys have some sense of this kind of local search, right? So the idea is that we're trying to update the solution little by little, correct? So we don't. So the local search, the policy should you know, could be very simple, something like this, right? We just change a little, right? But if we like, you know, repeatedly doing this, then that will be very powerful. So for example, let's change back to the uh, MATLAB. So can you see the MATLAB software here? Yeah. Wonderful. So let me just, uh, I think I need to enlarge the, uh, which one do I want? Mm, we see this is uh, the local search one. Uh, that would be 11. Uh, local search, this one. Okay, let's close all the rest. And then let's try to run this. Right. So let me just add a breakpoint here, right? Let's run it. So the first two lines, I just, you know, defined the, the weight for all the items and also the value for all the items, right? If you can compare this one, right? So pretty much that's the kind of uh, input for this problem. Uh, and then I think this is the wrong body. So we start from a very simple solution, right? Which is uh, zero and zero. And you can see that the objective that will be uh, zero, right? So here I have a very simple uh, kind of um, methods to up, uh, to obtain the objective function, right? So it's basically that the solution will be a kind of a, a vector of uh, you know five elements, and each element is either zero or one, right? And then actually I multiply the value with solutions, so that would be the total objective. So in this way that for example, if the solution is that one one one, which means that I will add all the values together, okay? So that's how this kind of, um, you know, uh, 
expression can get the you know the total uh, value for all the items. Similarly, for the to all the weights, actually we can multiply the weight vector by the solution. Right? So if some kind of uh, you know element is zero or is one, then we need to include that weight. So that's why we how we quickly evaluate the weight and the objective. And then we the second this line is trying to record all the solutions. Okay. So let's do the local updating, our local search. Uh, so at the first time, we need to, uh, on the very first iteration, we need to um, determine which iterator we want to update, right? Locally update. So here we pick the, the first one, then that will be the, which iterator will be the one. So, and then this line is trying to copy the old solutions to new solutions. And then we can um, update or manipulate the new solutions, right? Pretty much in this way, we can toggle or we can change the state of that a specific item, right? For example here, so you can see the initial solution is zero for all the five uh, components. But for this kind of a new solution, you can see here, the first uh, item, that would be one, right? If you look at this one, then we can evaluate this kind of a, uh, new solutions and we evaluate the objective and also the weight. So we can say that weight is four and the objective is 10. So here is a kind of a, a condition or kind of a, a kind of a, a judgment. So if the weight is within the constraint, right? Less than 15 kilogram and the objective is better than previous solution, right? Which means our local updating is working. Then we can update our objective, our weight, and our solutions pretty much, right? So by doing so, you can see that uh, the initial solution is all zero, is empty. And then because our new solution is somehow a tiny better than the old solution, then we can update it, right? So you can see that's the kind of things. And then this, again, this is trying to record all the uh, solutions. So you can glow it. So for the second iteration, uh, which item that will be equals to two, correct? Because we want to do the second one. You, you know, it's kind of um, uh, intuitive, right? We just uh, locally update each item, right? For here, again, we try to copy the, the current solution, which is one, one, one zero, zero, right? And because we pick the second item to be the item we want to change the state, right? Then you can see that the, again, the new thing, the new objective is better, right? Because we have a, a kind of a two items. And also the total weight somehow is, again, still valid. So, we can also update in this kind of a solution, right? This is a, a valid solution. So that's why we want to update or local search. So somehow local search or local update, they are kind of the same thing in this setting, okay? Then we can update the solution. So we can continue to run this and then we can find the third iteration, right? So for the third iteration, so again, this kind of um, expression is a way to, you know, um, do the kind of um, uh, iterating for the which item, right? So for each item, um, it will repeatedly from one to five. So that's why I use this kind of expression. Even if for a very large kind of uh, number of um, i. Again, this is a third iteration and we want to change the third items, the kind of state, right? So for now, the solution is, you know, the best one will be one and one, right? And then we hope want to change the third item, right? The third item initially is zero. So how about let's change it to one. Then here's comes the issue, right? We know that the objective of the solution is better, right? The 16, better than the previous 12. But the total weight here, the total weight is 17. Because you can see that the solution is that the first three items are selected, right? They are one and one, 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 one. So which means the weight of the first three uh, are kind of added up together. Four plus one plus 12, that will be uh, 17, right? So that's how we get this guy. But here 17 is somehow larger than the constraint. So we don't need it. So that's why we, if you look at here, be careful. If I continue 
then actually we skip this kind of updating. So which means this kind of updating is not good. So we don't use it. So that's fine. Sometimes it's it's the case, right? You, you cannot really update and uh, the, the things, right? Uh, then that's fine. We if we don't we cannot update the kind of uh, the third one. How about let's uh, update the fourth one then? So that will be the fourth item. So actually, you can repeat this whole process. You can see that uh, for now, <laughs> the solution is that the third item is still zero. We don't pick it. But at this kind of a moment, we want to uh, pack the fourth one, right? That's why we uh, kind of uh, have one at the fourth element. As you can see that for this kind of um, a new solution is very valid. And also uh, the objective is 14 is somehow is better than previous one. That's why we do the updating, right? And then you can update it. Uh, so we can actually repeat this guy, right? So pretty much that this is a fifth item. So actually, let's run through it. So at this moment, you can see that our solution is pretty much the optimal one, right? Just by toggle each item's uh, state uh, sequentially, right? And then we actually run five iterations, we can figure out the best solution actually. And then if you, you are not really con kind of convinced, actually we can try to run more iterations. So for example, here uh, we can run like uh, six iterations. So here comes the why we need this kind of expression. So if I i equals to six, then that would be, you know, come back to the first iteration or the first item, right? That's why we need this kind of expression. So by doing so, uh, you can do all the stuff. But you can see that this kind of updating will not, will never be uh, run because we already achieved the best solution. Okay, we can just run through it. So we can see that, uh, let me just, uh, let me just, okay. Let me just open the solution history for you. So you can see that, uh, pretty much uh, this is uh, not new actually on really this guy. So the point is that the solution will not be will never no will not be changed after the sixth iteration, right? So that's why we get this table. Okay, so you can see that this is a key idea of local updating or local search. It means that we start from a simple solution, but we can gradually you know, improve or refine the solution you know, just by tweaking or you know, tooling a, some tiny part, okay? Uh, hopefully, I'm clear about this. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh, I'm sorry for you, Ray. You, oh, I already, uh, I, okay, actually, Yuri is asking, can I expand the coding area? Uh, let's see. Do you still need it? Oh, probably. Let's do it later. Okay. <laughs> so that would be the whole stuff. Uh, yeah, if you have more kind of concerns, actually, um, yeah, I can talk about that later. Okay. But pretty much that, I hope you can get through this kind of course, right? By trying to change the solutions little by little. Okay, so this is a local search uh, policy for a knapsack problem, and then for a for this kind of a travel salesman problem, that will be different. Again, there's no general rule for you know, to solve this kind of a discrete optimization problem. So for each problem, you have to think about some like um, you know very unique way to solve it. So for example, for this problem, we want to know, uh, use the idea of local updating or local search to solve this problem. So what would be the best approach? Let's say we start from a very simple solution, right? Just one, two, three, four, five. Just the order of the you know the given water so what would be the local updating uh, policy you can think of just think about a very simple one a simple action that actually can improve the current solution a little so everybody please think about how can we you know modify this you know very simple solution 
just modify a little, but we can you know achieve a better solution. Make the third stop four. Yeah, so I think yeah. Uh I think uh, in the chatting room, Hannah is giving a solution pretty much that trying to swap fourth and five the fifth stop, right? We swap somewhere. Right? So actually that's the way for that one. Okay. So Madden, what what's your solution again? I, I didn't get it. Why it said just go to the what fourth stop? Yeah, like after two. So like for one, two, and then make the third stop four instead of three. Okay, yeah, no, that's the way, right? So pretty much you want to uh, kind of you know change their location or kind of swap the a different position, right? So I think that's the same idea. We want to swap or change this position to say this. For example, here we uh, because in this kind of a setting we we always start from the city one, right? So pretty much the city one is fixed. So for us, so the very intuitive method, that would be swap the second and third stop, correct? So that's something, the same idea. You can start from like changing the fourth and fifth one, and then let's, let me use a laser. So for now, we can change the, we can swap two and uh, the third, the second and third stop, right? Or we can swap anyway, right? Uh, it's up to you, but let's say how about we just start from these two pairs or these two cities, right? We swap their uh, positions, right? Um, oh, I think uh, I don't know your ID, but uh, the one student said that we can use the least distance count first. Uh, yeah, that would be the greedy approach, right? <laughs> but for here, it's another method. So we actually we can uh, that. Uh, we can swap the cities first, right? For example, we can swap the second and third one. So we can generate one simple solution, right? So we can see that we just modified a little of the to the solution, right? We modified a little. So pretty much that we just swap the second, third stops. But you can see that the distance somehow is reduced. So how do I compute the distance? So pretty much that for all the city, I give a coordinate to it. For example, the city three, that will be a zero, zero. That's x equal to zero, y equal to zero. And uh, city one, that will be x equal to five, and y equal to nine. Let's say the unit will maybe like, um, how about kilometers, something like this, okay? So that's the way we, uh, we set this kind of problem. And the distance is actually the kind of, uh, you know, the direct uh, length from uh, one, two, three, right? Uh, they, this might not be the real case, right? Because for real case, the route may be somehow very uh, kind of, uh, you know, zigzagging, right? But here we just compute the direct uh, distance. So pretty much for the first is a uh, kind of a solution. One, uh, two, three, four, something like this, right? For example, for this problem, for this solution, we just compute each, um, you know, the distance from the one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five, and five to one. And then we add this five segment together, we get a 44.9 uh, kilometers, uh, that's the distance for it. And then for the second iteration, we, you know, if you look at this kind of, you know, I'm kind of uh, playing, you know, kind of, you know, alternative between these two solutions, right? You can see that what, what is changed, right? Pretty much that the two and three, they are not swapped. Okay, so from the for a second solution, we can also uh, evaluate the solution or, or the kind of a, a distance, right? So that would be 41.2. So we actually uh, get a better solution, right? So we want to keep it. And then what next? So for the another iteration, what we want to do is that we want to pick another pair of our cities to swap, right? So because for second iteration, we pick the second and the third stop, right? So yeah, that would be a very good idea. So what if we pick the second and the fourth one, right? So which is a three, city three and city four, right? So that would be this kind of a thing and this kind of thing. How about this rabbit? 
So here actually I list uh, a lot of different iterations. So let's focus on the iteration three or the solution three. How about this? Let's focus on this kind of word, the third rule. So you can see that comparing with the third rule and the second solution, right? So the only difference is that the three, four, their positions actually are swapped, right? You can see this. So that's be one, four, two, three, five. But unfortunately, for this kind of uh, solution three, the distance is larger, right? It's somehow we're getting worse, so we don't want to use it. So this kind of uh, uh, the second and fourth swapping, this pair is not good. So we just ignore it. Then we can come to another kind of pair. Right? We, let's pick another one, which is from the second and the fifth one, right? Pretty much that is this guy, the CD3 and CD5. And then let's, let's do that kind of swap. Again, that would be the fourth solution, right? Which is four, five, and three, right? So in solution two, that'd be three and five. So we swap this kind of five and three. We spy their location. But again, I don't know, but by, you know, kind of uh, very luckily, they get the same very high distance, right? We don't want it. So we just ignore it. Then we go to which one? So we already compared the two, three, two, four, and two, five, right? So the next very intuitive one, that would be three and the fourth, right? The third and the fourth, correct? So which means if you compare the, the first one, right? So that'd be the third and the fourth one initially is two and four. And then we swap this kind of position, we get four and two, right? So for this, again, uh, very interesting. They have the same number. Right, maybe I'm wrong about this, but uh, again, this kind of numbers are very high, so we don't need, we use it. So which means three, four, this kind of swapping is like that. So we can go to the another pair, which is three and five, right? So you get the idea. So pretty much that we just change the pair of cities trying to swap them. So for example, here for solution six, we are trying to swap third and fifth one, which is uh, city three, uh, 32 and 35, right? So that would be five and two, correct? So we get a better solution, finally, right? And actually the solution six, that would be this kind of graph showing. So that's the optimal one. So you can see that's the optimal one. So pretty much this is a, uh, how we do this uh, kind of updating. So the idea is that we just, you know, peak, you know, sequentially or kind of, you know, continuously peak some like one pair of cities and swap them and then pick another pair of it and swap them. Okay, so that's the way we do it. So actually, again, we have some MATLAB to show this code. Uh, again, before we do the MATLAB uh, demo, and it, uh, the idea is clear, right? So how do we update this kind of uh, uh, city things, right? Okay, cool. So the idea is that we just update the, the kind of solutions little by little. Great. So uh, there's a question that if you do two, four, five, three, one, two, four, five, three, one, right? You want to reverse, you know, two, four, five, three, one. Yeah, so there's kind of a one question that if you do another kind of a solution, for example, you start from two and then you go four, five, three, one, that would be the same uh, distance. That's correct. So that's the reason we want to uh, kind of um, uh, remove this kind of a redundant solution, right? That's why we need to fix the first stop as the city one. So that's the reason we want to fix this guy. Because by doing so, we can eliminate the redundant solution, right? So pretty much that for this solution, you can pick two at the starting, that'll be two, four, five, three, one, and, right? And also, there, Somehow it's because it's symmetry, you can also do two, one, three, five, four, right? That's another kind of thing. Again, that's not really unique solutions, but you can find at least one solution, right? That's for this kind of a, a local search. But I should mention that the local search, because it's local, so it cannot guarantee the, you will get the optimal, the best, you know, the global optimal. It's local, right? So that's uh, somehow, because this, uh, this method is simple. Uh, for simple method, it's hard to uh, get the optimal, the uh, global optimal, but it can give you a relatively good uh, solution. And if you're lucky enough, sometimes you get the global optimal. 
But again, let's uh, try to see the MATLAB code. So that will be, okay, let's come back to Yuri's uh, kind of a comment. How about let's extend to this kind of a coding error, right? Hopefully you can uh, see clearly. And uh, that will be our travel assessment, right? This is a, this is a code to, you know, use local search to solve a problem. Uh, let's say you know, we can run it. Uh, here, I hope you can know this kind of a comment. It's called global and city positions. So this is this means that the variable here, the MATLAB variable here, the, the city positions is a global variable. So which means if you define a kind of a sub function, so we can actually use the city uh, positions. We can use these variables directly without you know putting it here. So sometimes you can put it here, right? So that's the way you can, you know, pass the value to it. But here we, because we declare that this variable is a global variable, then we can directly use it. So that's somehow it's simpler to, you know, uh, to do a lot of coding. So that's why, and you can use this trick too. So pretty much that declare some uh, variables, they are global, okay? So let's run it and then we can do the, Kind of debugging, right? This is a step. Let's call step, and then you can see that we pretty much define five cities position, right? And the first column is the x coordinates. The second column will be the y uh, coordinates, right? So let's plot. So you can see that. Can you see the figure? Okay, that's wonderful. So pretty much that you can see we have five circles, right? That would be the kind of, you know, this five cities, right? That's the locations. Somehow it's similar to our slice position, right? So we plot, this is a kind of a, their uh, relative uh, locations. And then let's say we start from a, again, this is not good. Let's try to move it. So this is a, our solution, right? Very, you know, simple solution. And then we can start from it. So here we can have a, uh, probably I want you to, to, you know, jump. Let's say we have the solution and then we have a evaluate distance, right? It's a function, right? Let's jump into that function to say what happened inside. So let's say we jump into the evaluate distance, right? It's a function, right? And then I pass, a kind of a solution. This solution is a one, two, three, four, five, right? That's the thing. And then uh, pretty much that I will compute the distance from the the last solution, the last city, this is city five, to the first city, right? So I need to, I want to compute from the last to the first. This is a company that they're coming back distance, right? That would be the first distance. Plus the other four distance, right? from the city, for example, you can actually go through it. This is a, from the city one to city two, right? And then from city two, from city two, you can go to city three, right? So by doing so, you can actually compute all the five segments of that loop, right? Hopefully you can get this idea. And then we can actually uh, step out. Okay, so that's how we evaluate each solutions, okay? And then again, you can ignore this kind of a line because that just helped me to uh, record all the solutions. Okay, this is a, so for now, let's just do some updating, right? Uh, the idea is that uh, because we want the first city to be fixed. So that's why we start from the kind of a second to the fifth one. And also the second, uh, you know, because we want to pick a pair of cities, right? That's why we have a two for loop. So the II will be the first city in that pair. JJ will be the second city in that pair, right? And then, oh, let's say here, we say that if the first pair number is smaller than the second one, right? By doing so, we are trying to, you know, uh, remove or eliminate some like redundant, you know, things or some very impossible. For example, if II equals to JJ, which is, um, Business, right? We don't want to pick the same city as a pair, right? So that's why we say pick the two and the third city as a pair, and then we we'll try to swap them. So here we first this this kind of um, 
code is trying to uh, copy the current solution right to a new solution and then for the new solution this line is pretty pretty much is trying to swap okay you can see that oh, um, i just okay let's just i'm sorry for that one so this kind of a line this line is trying to swap right because you can see that the jg1 is actually assigned to iigg right so pretty much we swap them so let's say for now you can see it's one two three four five right and then if i run this code then it will change to one three two four five correct so that's the magic for these kind of things right we can easily <laughs> swap the two cities positions okay so we can swap their order and then because we have a new solutions then we can actually call the function right we have this function called evaluate distance and then we can uh, pass this kind of a new solution to it then we can get a new objective value correct so that would be it's better right this is better because this kind of a solution the objective is better right and also there's no other constraints so if you are better then we can use it right so pretty much that our solution can be updated right because we have better solution then and also the objective we are this kind of thing is also um, kind of renewed so for this kind of thing is just to keep the record so you can ignore it uh, let's see oh, what happened oh that's weird okay and then pretty much that i run another did i run another one yes that's so let me pick another okay that's wrong for it another iteration right so pretty much that for this two and the four right so that's another pair so you can see that the new objective is somehow larger than the current one right so which means this solution is uh, bad it's worse right so we don't need it so you can see that it can be so look at this carefully so we if I run it, it will directly jump, right? So we don't update it. So that's how we do this kind of uh, uh, updating, okay? So we can, of course, we can run through it, right? Repeatedly, and then finally get some solution of it. Okay, so that the final solution will be one, three, four, five, two, right? And also because I have a code to record, record everything, right? So pretty much that if I open this kind of uh, the variables it will show that all the history right you can take a look at this one so that's all the possible uh, kind of solution are evaluated okay so this is a demo for a local search for this problem right so you can see that local search we are actually gradually uh, improve the solution but the thing is that we are not evaluating all the solution right because we pick or we kind of carefully uh, select some kind of solutions, right? So this is a very different from uh, brute force because for brute force, you need to evaluate all the solutions, right? But for local storage, actually, no, you just start from a, some a, you know, reasonable solution and then gradually improve it. So that's the way we do this kind of we call it local search, okay? So that would be uh, this methods. Uh, Okay, so that would be the any idea about this or any comments. So I think the take home message is that a local search is somewhat it's not really some kind of magic. It's just to start from some solution and then you have a kind of a, you know updating mechanism to gradually improve the solution. This is actually very useful. So in my in my research, actually, I occasionally use this kind of trick to you know solve a discrete optimization problem because somehow this is a very um, powerful one. You know, the local search the rule should be very simple, but it's very powerful. You can get some very good or relatively good solutions. Okay. Uh, we have another local search uh, due to the time limit. Probably I just gave it. So the idea is that uh, this is our continuous. Uh, our, the problem is a CAM problem, right? So you can see that um, this is uh, the problem and the D and H, that would be the integers. So for this problem, uh, actually, there's another local search. We call it kind of using matching grade. So if you, uh, so actually, matching grade 
This matching grid is the matching grid we talked about before, okay? This is the same matching grid. Uh, yeah, let me just you know, use one minute to uh, introduce these methods. So matching grid, that will be the, I think, the only method that actually, you know, you can use to solve continuous and disk uh, or discrete version. You can solve both. So for matching grid is also a local search problem. You can, if you think about the kind of mechanism of matching grid, right? Because for matching grid is actually a formal grid first, right? And then you determine like uh, whether the grid should be moved forward or should be reduced size, right? If you remember the matching grid, then matching grid actually can solve this problem. And the only trick or only difference for this kind of a discrete version is that we need to stop before the grid size is becoming fractional, okay? Because we hope that the solution is integer, right? So that's why we don't allow the kind of smaller than one solutions or kind of a fraction uh, solutions, right? Uh, let me just give you a very quick uh, kind of demo. So for this kind of a problem, we know that margin grid can only solve unconstrained problem, right? Over here, even if it's uh, continuous, but we have a con kind of a, you know, a constraints, right? So the idea is that we can use the penalty, right, to consider the constraints, and then we can use matching grid. So let me let me show you a very quick idea of this using matching grid to do it. So the idea that this kind of code is matching grid, the real matching grid. The this is a this is a sample code I sent to you actually. Okay. I sent to you the, the marching grid to you. Uh, and let's say, uh, and the only change is actually, uh, is it here? This sounds very weird. Mm. Oh, I don't think I saved the version. Uh, my goodness, probably it's in here. Probably I, I can, oh, I think, okay, I messed up. But anyway, so this is a, this is a kind of a, the code, okay? So the majority, almost everything is not changed, okay? This is a machine grid algorithm. The only change is that, first of all, the, the, the function should be changed, of course, right? This is a, an objective, and this is a penalty, right? If you remember, this is a penalty term. Of course, that's an objective change. The other, another change is here, which means if our grid size dx is smaller than one, then we need to break, okay? So that's something like this. We need to uh, kind of uh, stop. So that's the only change. Then we actually, we can solve out some solutions, okay? Um, so I missed skip the kind of explanation for this code because it's pretty simple, right? We just need to uh, add this kind of condition, right? We just stop at the right time. So that's how we solve this one. So pretty much that we use a marching grid to solve this kind of a discrete version. But the thing is that before the solution is getting discrete or, or getting like a continuous, right? Getting like a fractional, we stop. So that's how we uh, solve this kind of problem using marching grid, right? The same algorithm, the same kind of code, only thing, different thing that we stop at the right time. Uh, everybody clear about this method? Okay, so that's wonderful, that's wonderful. So, okay, so it seems that we spend a lot of time, right? We only have 20 minutes to talk about the rest two algorithm. Hopefully we can cover it. If not, actually I can uh, record an, some uh, extension video for you. Uh, okay, so, but let's try to do that. So the second uh, algorithm is very powerful. This is called dynamic programming. So among all these six methods, dynamic programming, actually that's the one can guarantee your solution is optimal. Okay, so dynamic programming, is very powerful because it can guarantee the solution is optimal. Okay, so that's uh, until now, that's the only solutions we can guarantee it's optimal. Okay, so dynamic programming is very powerful. 
uh, but it's very hard. So let's say what's the idea of dynamic programming. So let's use the example of knapsack problem. Okay. So again, for knapsack problem, you can see here we have uh, five airforms, right? And the bag is 15 kilograms uh, constraints. Uh, you know, to illustrate this kind of algorithm, actually, I change their uh, order <laughs> a little bit. Okay. So x1 will be this atom, x2 this one, x3, x4, x5. So you can see that uh, pretty much that x1 is um, somehow the, you know, the the weight the lightest one right so that's something like uh, I need to do but actually this doesn't matter we can use any order of it for this uh, kind of dynamic programming so the key idea of dynamic programming is this kind of a you know this red line right let me just use a okay let me use the laser pointer so is this kind of a, this kind of sentence the dynamic programming is the idea that we reuse the solutions for small problems. The idea is that we solve small problems first, and then we store their, we save their solutions, right, in the in our kind of a computer memory, and then we reuse them directly without repeated solving. So that's the idea of a dynamic programming. We just reuse the solution for some problem, and from the operational wise, so so how do uh, what what's look like for this kind of a dynamic programming? So here's something like this. It's pretty easy, actually. You just need to fill or fill out the whole table, okay? So this table is actually the dynamic program table. If you can fill out this table, and then you can get a solution. So if you look at the bottom, bottom right, this kind of a cell, 15, that would be the objective. That would be the optimal value for it. So the kind of a, the trick for dynamic programming it's very simple. It's just trying to fill out a table, either 1D, sometimes you just fill out one column, or sometimes a table, something like this, okay? So the idea is trying to fill out a table, okay? And uh, you can see that for this table, the horizontal, this guy, that would be the knapsack capacity, okay? So for example, we have uh, zero capacity, and we can hold one kilogram, two kilogram, and the vertical, the vertical, column or the vertical axis, that would be the atoms. This is the first atom and second atom, third, fourth, five atom, right? We can list all the atoms here, all the atoms. So the order doesn't matter, okay? The order doesn't matter. But I put it here just to illustrate the equity. The order doesn't matter. You can put any kind of order. But the thing is that we have five atoms, right? At the, for the kind of, you know, uh, five rows for it. And we have 15 columns, right? Corresponding to the kind of uh, capacity, okay? That's the way. So let's talk about how do we generate this table, okay? Uh, let's see. So again, let's start from our kind of a philosophy, right? Our philosophy is that we want to start from small problem first, right? And then we save the solutions. For example, in this problem, what is small problem? This problem is this one. For example, for the first column, so if our capacity, if our lap sack, the capacity is zero, right? We cannot hold anything. Then the solution will be simple, right? Because the lab, the capacity is zero. Then no matter how many atoms we have, I can only hold zero one, correct? That's the simplest problem, correct? Okay, so everybody agree with this? Another simplest one is, if you have only one item, for example, the X1, right? The one item, which has a weight of, uh, you know, weight of one, one kilogram, right? Then it's very simple, right? If your lap sack capacity somehow is equal to one or larger than one, then you can have this item, right? Which means your value will be the value of this item, right? Then the solution will be one, one, one right? So keep in mind that all the value in this kind of a table is the optimal value for that small problem. For example, I should say, or, you know, I should say for each kind of cell, it represents one problem. For example, here, it means that the capacity, for example, uh, let's focus on this three. You can see my laser, right? Laser pointer, can you? 
Okay, so look at this kind of three, right? My laser pointer is kind of, uh, you know, focusing on. Then this kind of cell is representing one problem. The problem is that the capacity is seven and we have uh, two atoms, the one and another one, right? So that's the meaning of this kind of a cell. It means that it's a problem with seven capacity and two atoms, right? And the best solution or the optimal um, objective is three. Okay, that's the idea of it. So we store the object value to all the cells and then we can feel this kind of things, okay? So for now, we have already solved small problems, right? With the capacity is one or the kind of uh, I terms, only one I terms, right? Then we want to propagate, we want to move on, right? So the first one will be this guy, right? What if we have the capacity is one, and then we have two atoms, right? This kind of x1, x2. So how to solve this problem? So because compared with previous solutions, that the only difference is that we have an extra term, right? The second term, the second I term, right? So for here, we need to Determine. We need to. We have two options. If we look at this kind of uh, option, we have two options. Option one is that we want to pack this new term x two, right, which has a weight of one and two dollars. We want to pack it. If we pack this kind of x two, what happens? If we pack this atom, then the weight, you know, because this atom is already packed inside of the the lab sack, right? Which means our lab, the capacity right, of the bag, somehow the capacity is reduced by the weight of this atom, correct? This is very critical, correct? Okay, so because we determine to pack this atom, which means that the capacity will be reduced by the weight of this atom, right? Then the capacity will change to from one to zero, right? So which is this term? Because we know that if the capacity is zero and you have one term, one item to pack, that small problem has been solved, right? So which means the optimal is zero, right? Because this small problem have been solved, has been solved. So we can see that we directly put this two plus the previous optimal, right? That will be two value, the two dollars plus the small problems optimal, right? That will be two plus zero equals two, correct? So this is how we reuse the solutions for small problems, okay? We pretty much decompose a bigger problem into a smaller one, you get it? So that's very critical. I hope everybody can say yes. That's cool. So pretty much that, that's a dynamic programming. You decompose a bigger problem into a smaller one. And then because the smaller problem has been solved, then you can directly use the solution, use the optimal value, and then directly construct your optimals. Okay? So that's the key idea. And in this case, we know that the option one is that we want to pack it. That will result in two, right? And another solution is that, another option is that we don't want pack it, right? If we don't pack it, then, if we don't pack it, then the capacity is still one, right? It's the same, right? Because we don't pack it, then that'll be one. And this capacity will determine uh, the, the rest atom will be the first atom, right? So for the small problem with capacity one and uh, one atom, then we know the solution is one, right? So which means the optimal is one, we directly use it. So pretty much is that if we don't want to pack this atom, then we directly copy the, uh, the solution bar, correct? Everybody should say yes, correct? Okay, that's wonderful. So pretty much that we can compare, we have two options, right? Either compact this kind of term or we don't pack it. Then we can actually compare these two options. Then we can see that the first option, right? To pack it is better then our solution here is somehow two, okay? So that's a, this bigger problem has been solved, right? With one kilogram capacity and two atoms, right? Then we solve it, okay? So that's the idea how we do it. So we have two options and we pick the best one. Then we can solve it, that's two, correct? Let's do an exercise, how about this? So we want to pick this guy. 
How about this? How should it be? Three, right? I think somebody talked about three. The idea is that for this, we want to determine, do we need to pack X2 or not? Correct? If we want to pack it, then we pack it. Then the capacity, because this item has width one, then we need to reduce our capacity to one, right? And for capacity one with item one, we know the optimal is one. So directly add two and with one, right? Then you got three. That would be the dollar three, three dollars for this solution. That's option one. Another option is that we don't pack it. If we don't pack it, then the capacity is, uh, you know, uh, I should say it's the uh, two for this one. Uh, let me just change it. I should change it. Uh, uh, hold on. So this is a uh, two, right? Because if we don't pack this kind of X2 atoms, then the capacity is the uh, two. Oh, I'm, I think I forgot to upload the slide for you first. But anyway, so hopefully this is a, you can review this kind of slide later. But again, you can see that we have two options. For option one is that we want to, uh, we, we can't have this kind of things, right? Or we don't pack this term, then the capacity is still two. So for the problem with capacity two and atom one, we know it's, uh, the solution is one, right? So that's why if we compare these two options, so the three wins, right? That's why we have three, okay? So we can do all the things, you know, they are same, right? And then let's do one more exercise. So for this term, right, what should it be? Again, I already gave you the solution, right? So for this kind of uh, option, you can see that this is another bigger problem, right? We have capacity one and with three items, right? One, one, two, three items. So our decision is, do we want to pack X3, right? If we want to pack this, which is impossible, right? Because this item has two kilogram, right? Which is too heavy for the pack. So we don't pack it, right? Then that would be just, you know, it's impossible, so don't use it. Then the only next option will be, we don't pack it, and then that will be the capacity of one. So for capacity one and, and with two items, so we know the solution is two, then pretty much that we have the solution two, right? But that's how we do it. So actually we can compare this, right? Continue to do it. And then finally we can get this table. So I hope everybody can, you know, get sense of this one. You can re revisit this video, okay? Or you can talk to me later if you think you are confused by this dynamic programming. But the basic idea is you just fill out this kind of um, table. And the way to fill out the table is pretty much that if you want to fill out this one, then you need to decompose this problem with the smaller problems, okay? So that's the idea. You reuse the solutions for some more problems. And that's the key thing for dynamic program. So, okay, that would be this, this one. So for now, we fill out the whole table. We got 15, right? That would be the $15. That would be the total uh, optimal value for the solutions. But for this, for now, at this point, we only know the objective function. How do we get the solutions, right? How do we get solutions? So here, this is uh, how we get solutions. So if you look at carefully at this table, you can see I actually, you know, bold did some kind of numbers, right? 15, 15, let me use the laser. So this guy is bolded. This guy also bold, right? It's, it's bold, see that? That's why I do that. So the idea is that it's pretty simple to generate a solution. So you start from the very bottom right one, okay? Very bottom right one, 15, right? And then you look at the, you know, the value above. You compare this two value, okay? 15, 15. If these two value are same, what does it mean? 15, 15, what does it mean? 15, 15. From 15 to 15, anybody can say what does it mean by we have a, you know, we have a capacity 15 and uh, anybody knows what happened here? Uh, 
yes, it's not required, which means I think there's no updating. That's very good, which means there's no updating, right? There's no add on value, right? Which means that this item is not selected, okay? So if the two values are same, which means this, the fifth item is not selected, okay? That's why we can generate one solution for one item, right? Which means x5, the value setting is zero, right? Because we don't need it here. Then we can move up to this kind of 15, right? And then we can compare the value above, right? Which is five, right? Five is smaller than one. What does it mean? So compare five and 15. It's updating, right? Or it's kind of updated or kind of required, which means that this kind of uh, item is required. Then we need to use it, which means the X4, X4 here is pretty much required. And then that will be one for X4, okay? And then what do you need to do that? Because X4 is already included, which means our capacity will be reduced by four kilograms, correct? Because we already included this guy, correct? So which means we want to reduce the kind of capacity by four. So which means you can move up and then move left or shift left by four kilograms. That would be one, two, three, four. Okay, that's I marked this kind of five. You got it? So how I move from 15 to five? The reason is that because this number five and 15 are different and then we got this kind of a four numbers, okay? That's something different, right? So we want to move left and how much? That would be four kilograms. That's why we have four, one, two, three, four, five, right? Again, at this moment, we compare the value above with this value, right? Three is smaller than five, which means this item at three is included, right? And then we, we, we need to pick a three, right? And then, but if we pick a three, then two kilogram will be reduced. Then we move to move up and then to left by two kilogram. You know, by doing so, we can pick, we can select all the things. Okay, you get it, everybody? Okay, that's wonderful. So let's say another, this is a, another kind of uh, thing that, uh, another slide is that I use a different order to optimize the problem. For example, this is a very common one, right? one, two, three, four, right? We can see that this is a different from this kind of order, right? But you can see we still get the same solution, 15 and the solution are same, okay? So which means the order of the item doesn't matter, okay? So that's why, I think that would be the, the things for this kind of uh, methods, dynamic programming, right? We are trying to reuse solutions for small problems. Pretty much we start from small problems and then move to like bigger one, right? Uh, so unfortunately we are, I think we are running out of time. Uh, let me see. Uh, we have three minutes, let's say. Um, so probably I can quickly go through the last algorithm. So last algorithm is that it's something like you just use MATLAB to solve it because there's no way for you for us to, uh, you know, that's, that's because the algorithm is very complex. So uh, let's say, should I talk about this? Yes, let's just go quickly, okay? So the last methods that will be called integer linear programming, okay? So it's linear. Uh, I think that's too much fun. Probably we can cover this for the next lecture. I cannot pack it for two minutes, okay? So we will talk about this kind of algorithm uh, for next lecture, okay? Uh, so at the beginning of next lecture, we will talk about this first. Uh, and then let, let's see, I should do this. I'm very confused. I'm kind of, uh, do you want me to do it? Yeah, so let's do a kind of, uh, if you want to do it, we need like a 
about 10 minutes, something like this. Okay, thank you, everybody. So I apologize because we have a lot of uh, algorithms here. Okay, let's do it. That's wonderful. So uh, let's do it. So let's say uh, I will show you the dynamic programming uh, codes later after this guy, okay? So for this kind of uh, uh, integer linear programming, it's a uh, this is a, I think this algorithm, that will be the most powerful and the most valuable algorithm for all the problem. It's somehow a lot, it's very general. I mean, it can solve most problems and the most, uh, you know, a kind of a big companies, they're actually uh, providing the packages to solve these problems. And uh, again, most industry applications will solve problems using this algorithm. And this algorithm is very, like, um, I mean, powerful, and the people make money from it. But for us, we just need to use it, okay? So to use this kind of uh, algorithm, so the key point is linear programming, right? So pretty much is that you need to formulate your problem in a way that the problem is linear. Everything is linear. For example, in this, our lapsack problem, right? Um, let me explain this kind of things here. So our goal is trying to maximize the value within the bag, correct? So that would be the kind of, um, uh, so that would be the, that would be the kind of uh, linear programming, right? It's the objective is linear. Linear means you can say that it's 10x, 2x, right? Everything is linearly combined together. Right, which means we can say x1 is this term. The value will be the decision variables of x1 will be either zero or one, right? If it's zero, which means we don't have the ten dollars. If it's one, which means we have this kind of ten dollars, right? So that's the objective. We can add all the things together, correct? So that's the objective. And for the constraint, is somehow we add all the weight together, right? For example, if we have the x1, right? which means x1 equal to one, then we have four kilogram, right? So we can add all the decision together, that will be the full weight within the bag. And this kind of total weight, okay, should be smaller than 15, correct? So that will be the kind of uh, constraints for it. That's it, so pretty much that's the linear problems. And all the else is that x1, two, three, four, five, this should be binary, right? Either Zero or one. Okay, so that would be the kind of a, you know problem formulation. So if you want to use integer linear programming, then your model must be that linear, which means your objective should be linear. There's no x square or like exponential or like you know x one times two. There's no complex, just linear. Again. For linear programming, that's very powerful. Actually, you can model most of the problem in linear, okay? You can use linear program to at least approximate, okay? That's why this is very powerful and also simple. That's why we have the algorithm to solve it because it's linear, it's constraints linear. The only difference is that x1, 2, 3, 5 is binary. And to, in order to use MATLAB for the problem, we need to modify a little bit. So the first thing that, we need to use the vector to you know, represent the problem, okay? Because here, 10, 2, 4, that's the coefficient, right? So we can actually extract it as a vector. And then x1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is another vector. Then they can multiply together. So that would be, so they are equal, okay? And then similarly, for the constraints, you need to use a vector to solve it. That would be another kind of constraints. And uh, because we call it integer, right? Integer means that it can be one, two, three, four, any number. So, because here it's one, two, one or zero or one, right? We need to consider this guy. Pretty much is that we say xi is integer, but we bound it as zero and one, okay? That's the way how we formulate xi as integer, but the constraint is zero one. And then for MATLAB, you only need to use this kind of a four or five lines to solve it, okay? The first line, if you say F, that will be this kind of a coefficient, okay? And A, that will be the constraints coefficient. 
and the B15, that would be the right hand of that constraint. Okay, that's equality constraint, or less than equality constraint, okay? And then you have a lower bound, it's zero, 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 zero. That's five zero, which means the five distinct variables lower bound, okay? And then upper bound will be one, one, one. That'll be the upper bound for the five act integers, okay? So you can see that this will be the, the bounding. And then the integer constraint here, it means that we have five different decisions, right? And the, all of them are integers. So it means the indices of the, so you can see that the one, two, three, four, five, these five numbers are integer constraints, okay? That's the way to uh, kind of uh, uh, specify which integer or which variable is integer, okay? So in this case, for example, if you just leave three, right? One, two, four, five, which means one, two, four, five are integers and the three is um, continuous, okay? That's the way it should be very flexible. You can represent both integers and continuous, okay? So that's a kind of a syntax for MATLAB to solve this one. And then you can plug in the things here and the comment is called, you can see here, can you see that? It's called integer linear programming. Okay, that's a name for this one, integer linear programming, and then done. Everything's done, okay? You got it? So that's the, the way we use um, MATLAB to solve problems. So the key thing here is, probably let me just, uh, let me just show you this kind of things, okay? Uh, very quickly, let me show you. Uh, I think using uh, integer programming. Okay, you can see here. Everybody can see it, right? Do you? Okay, good. So here you can see that's the five uh, lines, right? And then what we do is pretty much we just run it, and then you can see that. Uh, let's x. So that will be one one zero one one. So that will be our solution. This is an optimal solution. Okay, that's how we do it. Wonderful, right? And also, uh, there's a link. You can go, go home and take a look at this link. This is a, a travel salesman link. So you can solve a very complicated uh, travel salesman, okay? Uh, probably, uh, yeah, we still have some minutes, mm, if we have 10 minutes. Mm, you can see this is the last, well, we are about to close, okay? So, this is a travel salesman problem, okay? And you can see that this is a, you have a hundred, maybe 200 different a kind of cities. And then this kind of, a, you know, this is a, the code to solve it. So pretty much the key thing here, right? Integer linear programming. That's the comment to solve it, okay? Integer linear programming. Then you can solve the problem. And uh, pretty much that you can find the kind of, you know, for a very complex problem, you can easily find the best solution, okay? So that's uh, how to use the uh, commercial packages to solve problems, right? But the downside or the, no, it's not downside. The very critical thing is that the modeling, which means you have to ensure that your problem is linear, okay? So for example, for our kind of travel salesman, how do we formulate this problem as a linear kind of a problem, right? So you can see these are some kind of a, uh, let me see, I can post some like uh, reading material for you. So pretty much people can formulate travel salesman into a linear version, okay? This is a linear version. The objective is linear. The kind of a constraint is linear, okay? If everything is linear, then we can use the integer linear program to solve it, okay? So that would be the, and again, in MATLAB, you only need to do this one, integer linear program. This is the only common you need to use. And there are many other packages to solve it. So that's a common like the CPLEX I mentioned before, right? So this kind of things, uh, you just, you know, get rid, you know, you want to, if you want to know it, then you can use it. So pretty much I, I list a kind of, you know, a link here. So you can take a look and to say what there is kind of a commercial a package that looks like. But mostly MATLAB is very powerful. You can use it for you know, kind of a relatively large scale problems. 
okay? So I think that will be the, uh, uh, maybe the last, this is the final uh, slides. So we, in total, we introduced six different uh, algorithms to solve optimize, uh, discrete optimizing problem. Okay, so that would be the, the summation. Okay, and uh, so I will sum it, I will post all the uh, codes, sample codes for all the algorithms. Okay, so that we can, uh, you guys can run it and uh, compare and study it. So, okay, that would be it. I'm sorry for this kind of a 10 minutes delay. Okay, um, and enjoy your week. So, I will post the homework uh, shortly. Okay. So just let me know anything you think which is very challenging or you have some issue with the problem, with the lectures, with everything, right? Just let me know and I can, hopefully I can help. That's great. So thank you everybody. Yeah, have a, have a good time. Okay, bye-bye. Great, bye-bye. Let me just end this kind of meeting.